Good morning and welcome to today's Professional Matters webinar about the services that rental property managers and trading services licensees can provide with regard to rental property listings, ongoing management of the rental property, and about the brokerage's obligations in rental listings. My name is Alex Longson. I'm a professional standards advisor here at the RECBC, and I will be presenting today's webinar and answering your questions about this topic. To let you know a little bit more about myself and my professional background, I've been at the council for seven years and have worked in compliance and now as a professional standards advisor. Prior to then, I was a managing broker licensed for both strata and rental property management. And before that, before emigrating from the UK in 2005, I was an automotive test engineer from Ford Motor Company, so quite a different background. I want to start by acknowledging that today's webinar is being hosted here in our offices in downtown Vancouver, which is in the traditional territory of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Before I get started, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session and will be accessible through the same link that you're using now. It will also be posted on, in the licensee knowledge base on the council's website. The PowerPoint of today's presentation will also be made available afterwards in the licensee knowledge base. And I hope that you'll find it a useful training tool at your brokerage meetings to help keep licensees at your brokerage aware of the services they can and cannot provide with either a trading services license or a rental property management license. As we'll see in today's presentations, there are some important differences to be aware of. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer questions on today's topic during the question and answer period, which will be at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please feel free to send it through the ask a question tab in the chat function. For those of you who are familiar with this uh, Zoom presentation portal and have used it before, please note that the hands up feature has been disabled on this occasion. If I don't get to your question during today's webinar, then we will be sure to follow up afterwards. So I know that today's topic is of real interest to many real estate licensees. So let's dive in. Today's learning objectives in today's webinar are understanding the definitions in the Real Estate Services Act, understanding the services that trading service licensees can provide, understanding the services that rental property management licensees can provide, knowing what requirements and obligations on the, of the brokerage there are with respect to rental listings. So let's get started. <clears throat> First of all, a review of the definitions in RESA, Real Estate Services Act. Uh, trade in real estate, this is fundamental to all parts of the different sectors in the industry. A trade in real estate means a transaction for the purchase or sale of real estate or for the leasing of real estate or any other form of acquisition or disposition of the real estate. The important word here for today's seminar is for the leasing of real estate. Leasing includes renting. So we'll move now on to trading services definition. Trading services means any of the following services provided to or on behalf of a party to a trade in real estate. I'm not going to read through all of them on this, uh, at this point in time because we're going to go th back to each of the uh, different parts of the definition as we talk, as we go through the presentation. But just be aware that everything I'm talking to comes back to this definition. The same applies for rental property management services means any of the following services provided to or on behalf of an owner of rental real estate. So what can you do and what can't you do? Uh, I'll explain first of all that there are color codes um, on the different screens for rental property management licensees and trading services licensees. So you'll see the differences. This rental property management licensee is in a dark blue. So can I help a landlord find tenants? Well, I hope so. The answer is yes, of course you can. 
Uh, you can advertise the property, show the property, take the tenant applications, shortlist, prepare the lease or tenancy agreement, negotiate the rent and the terms of the tenancy agreement, and you can collect the tenant signature on the tenancy agreement. It's what you do all the time. Now, trading services licensees, can you? Actually, the answer is still yes. And that goes back because it's a lease, a trading service, uh, a, a trade in real estate includes a lease, so a Rent, uh, trading services licensee can do exactly the same. Uh, <clears throat> so now back to rental property management licensees. Can I help a prospective tenant find a property to rent? Again, here's, here's where you can't. Because rental property management services means any of the following services provided to or on behalf of an owner of rental real estate. Now, you may think sometimes that you're working for a tenant, uh, trying to find them the property. They come into your office and they say, can you, can you find somewhere for me to rent? You're typically not. You're actually just showing them your, the, your current listings that you have on behalf of your, your owner client. But, you, but your client is always the landlord, never the tenant. Trading services licensees now asking the same question. Can I help a prospective tenant to find a property to rent? Well, on this occasion, you can. And that's because you work on behalf of sellers and buyers all the time. That's what you do in your career. And a buyer is no different to a tenant, whereas a seller is no different to a landlord. So for rental property, you can, you can have a tenant as your client and you can show them the rental property, prepare the lease or tenancy agreement on their behalf negotiate the rent and the terms of the tenancy agreement, collect the tenant signature on the, on the lease or tenancy agreement and present the offer to rent. We use the word offer there, uh, offer to rent the, the rental property. Let's go back to rental property management licensees now. Can I collect rents from tenants on behalf of a property owner? Yes, that's what you do. Uh, rental property management services means uh, any of the following services, collecting rents or security deposits. And that's part of the definition of, 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 the, uh, of rental property management services. Trading services licensees, can you? Well, actually the answer is no. Um, and the reason you can't is because the definition of trading services does not include collecting rents. But, We'll ask that same, we'll slightly change that question now. Can a trading services licensee collect a security deposit from tenants on behalf of the property owner? And actually the answer to that is yes, because under the definition of trading services, you are allowed to receive deposit monies paid in respect of the real estate. So the, the definitions do not define what type of deposit. So a deposit can mean a deposit for um, uh, contract of purchase and sale, but it can also mean deposit um, as per the Residential Tenancy Act in regards to a security deposit or pet damage deposit. So rental property management licensees, can you do this? Can you collect security deposits? Well, we've already gone through the definition uh, and that includes collecting rents or security deposits. Security, pet damage deposits, you can do that. Trading service licensees. Now we're going back and forth be, be, between the two. You, you'll, you'll see how this works. Uh, trading service licensees. Can I make payments on behalf of the property to uh, property owner to third parties? Well, no, you can't. And again, it comes back to because you have to look at the definition that, that you act under. Uh, and there's nothing in the definition of trading services for which you're licensed for that allows you to collect, uh, make payments on behalf of the property owner. Rental property management licensees. Well, looking at the definition that you act under, you can manage the real estate on behalf of the owner and you can make payments to third parties. So you can do things like paying the contractors for providing services to or on behalf of the owner. Trading services licensees again now. So I'm just gonna grab a drink. So trading services licensees. Can I negotiate or enter into contracts on behalf of the owner? Well, no, you can't. Um, <clears throat> your, the definition that you act under in, under trading services 
you, you are allowed to negotiate contracts on behalf of your client. So you can negotiate the tenancy agreement or lease, but you, you cannot enter into a contract on behalf of an owner. And the Real Estate Council has, de has determined that a move-in condition inspection report is a contract entered into on behalf of the owner. It's binding the, the landlord to the tenant as to the condition of the property at the start of the, of the, um, the tenancy agreement compared to the end of the tenancy agreement. And of course, that determines what security deposit is returned. So that's a contract. Uh, and training services licensees can't do that moving, inspect, moving condition inspection report. Also means you can't sign the tenancy agreement. But rental property management licensees, you already know the answer to this. Can you negotiate or enter into contracts on behalf of the owner? Yes. Uh, and that's because it's defined in, in rental property management services. You can negotiate or enter into contracts. <clears throat> so you can sign the tenancy agreement or lease. You can carry out the condition inspection reports, move in reports and move outs. And you can arrange for contractors to provide services on behalf of the owner. <clears throat> and actually, I'll just quickly cover that. Uh, when you pick the phone up to call a plumber or buy a washing machine on behalf of the owner, every time you're doing that, you're entering into a contract. But the, the reason you can do that is because it's determined in the definition that you act under. Trading services licensees, back to you now. Can I supervise employees or contractors hired by the owner? Well, no, you can't. And it comes back to the definition. Everything has to go back to the definition. There's nothing in the trading services definition that allows you to supervise employees or contractors engaged by the owner. Rental property management licensees, can you? Yes, of course you can. Uh, it says so right there in the definition that you act under. Supervising employees or contractors engaged by the owner. There it is. So what this also means uh, for those of you that uh, manage uh, rental buildings on behalf of a single owner, uh, some of those rental buildings include an employee of the owner, their caretaker. So you can supervise that caretaker uh, on behalf of the owner because that's what your definition allows. So you see all of the things that you do on as a general day-to-day -day basis, it all stems back because of, the, of the, the wording of the definition. Trading services licensees. This is the last bet. Can I manage landlord and tenant matters? Well, no, you can't. And again, it comes back to the fact that it's not defined in a trading service. But rental property management licensees, can you? Well, yes, you can. Uh, it's defined under rental property management services. You can manage landlord and tenant matters. What that means is that you can provide any statutory notices as required by the Residential Tenancy Act. You can provide all ongoing management of the, of the property and the, and, the, and the tenant and owner relationship. And you can provide ongoing communication between the tenant and the owner, including being the contact for the tenant to call in the event of issues surrounding the tenancy lease of the rental property or the property itself. You, you know that call at three o'clock in the morning while washing machine's broken. You can do all of those things. So I just got to find the little thing here. Move on to the next slide. So that's, that's the first part of the presentation completed. Now we've got some questions that people have asked us previously. Are licensees required to make 510 and 510.1 disclosures to prospective tenants? Hopefully by now you all know that 5-10 and 5-10.1 are the two new disclosure forms that came into um, existence with the rule change in June, on June 15th of last year the disclosure of representation of trading services form and the disclosure of risks to unrepresented parties. So both trading service licensees and rental property management licensees have to use these forms when dealing with, with landlords and tenants. 
Uh, and that beca that's because the definition of rental property management services includes trading services in respect of the real estate. So, and the, the, the new rule requires that before providing trading services, a licensee must disclose whether or not the licensee will represent the party as a client. And that's the, that's the 510 disclosure representation of trading services form. Uh, so if a licensee is working on behalf of the landlord and they are also then dealing with tenants and they meet a tenant, they also have to do the 510 form for them. And they also have to do the disclosure of risks to unrepresented parties form, which is the 5-10.1. Can a managing broker choose not to allow rental listings? Well, Managing brokers aren't always the owner of the brokerage, but as far as the real estate council is concerned, they're the ones that decide what the brokerage can do. Now, behind the scenes, it may actually be the owner of the brokerage that decides what can and can't be done, but because the managing broker is responsible to ensure that the business of the brokerage is carried out competently and in accordance with the Act, Regulation Act and bylaws, and that there's adequate supervision for the other licensees, they need to be confident in the first place that if there is any rental listings going on, that the managing broker can ensure compliance with, with that rule. So, if, so before you as a licensee um, decide to take on a rental listing, ask your managing broker first of all to confirm that he or she is comfortable and happy with the, the brokerage um, doing rental listings. Is the managing broker responsible for rental listings posted by licensees on MLS, Craigslist, or in fact, any other medium, whether it be radio, TV, magazine, newspaper, um, or of course on the internet? Um, yes, but only to the same degree that managing brokers are already responsible for listings for properties for sale. So you, the managing broker takes on that, that role as managing broker. Um, so that they have an oversight of everything that the licensees are doing. <clears throat> Does a brokerage need a service agreement to list a rental property? So trading services licensees are familiar with the listing, the, the listing agreement, whether or not it's a, a, a brokerage designed listing agreement or an MLS listing agreement. That's a service agreement in the same way uh, that uh, all licensees need to have a service agreement before providing real estate services. Um, it's the same for rental listings. And 5-1 of the rules makes that clear. A written service agreement is required unless waived by the client. Do the real estate council's advertising requirements apply to rental listings? Yes, a very big yes. Um, the advertising requirements that apply to all forms of advertising by real estate licensee, whether in trading services, rental property management, or strata management services. Um, so if you're, if you're unclear or un unfamiliar with the advertising requirements, they are identified in the rules. Um, we also have a link to the advertising requirements on the front page of our website. Can a trading services licensee do a credit or background check of a prospective tenant for an owner? I'm going to pause for a few seconds, give you a chance to think. <clears throat> the answer is yes. Um, doing a credit check or a background check is not, a real, is not defined as a real estate service. Um, so you can do that on behalf of your clients, the landlord. However, and there is a very, very big, however, uh, licensees, whether they be trading service licensees or rental property management licensees who do carry out this function for their owners, for, for their clients, must be very careful not to breach PIPA, the Personal Information Protection Act. Um, a licensee should not be overzealous in the information that they collect. And before they decide to go down the, 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 the road of deciding whether or not to do credit or background checks for their clients. They should review the, the Privacy Commissioner's Guideline for Private Sector Landlords and Tenants. This can be found on the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of BC's website. Um, and 
we will provide you, we can provide you a link to that in the supporting documentation after today. Do I, the licensee, have an obligation to disclose a material latent defect in a rental property? Well, trading services licensees um, know all about this in regards to, the, to your selling real estate and rental property management licensees also understand. 5-13 of the rules um, applies. A licensee must disclose a known material latent defect to tenants before entering into a tenancy agreement or lease. Um, so what that means, if, if the suite that you're renting on behalf of the owner is an unauthorized suite, or there's unpermitted renovations, then there's no permits for the property. So that is a material latent defect as per the definition of 513, and it must be disclosed. Um, if, if you're unfamiliar with 513, take a look uh, and make sure that you comply. So what is the brokerage's obligation regarding collecting security deposits? So rental property management licensees, you've done all of this before. Um, many of, of the brokerages will be collecting security deposits of, on uh, behalf of the owners. Uh, I know some choose not to, and it's defined in the, in the service agreement that they don't collect the security deposit and it's given to the owner directly. Trading service licensees, when you're doing rental listings, this is something that you need to think about as well. Are you going to be collecting the security deposit from the tenant on behalf of your client for the rental listing, or is the tenant going to be paying that security deposit directly to the owner? If the brokerage is going to collect the security deposit, then the managing broker needs to, needs to consider Section 27 of the Real Estate Services Act. Uh, so without getting in too much into uh, rules speak, 27 bracket four of the, of the, of the rules require, uh, states that if by written agreement, um, the, the brokerage is not collecting the money or uh, they can uh, not, com not necessarily comply with section 21 uh, to 27 bracket one or 27 bracket two, which regard which requires the brokerage to collect the money and put it into a trust account. Uh, but you must consider section 27 four as to uh, what you will be doing in the future. And if you collect cash, you have to deposit into a trust account. You have no op You have no other option. If it's a uh, check bank draft or money order in the name of the owner and you've agreed with the owner that you're going to pass it directly to them in the service agreement, then you can, you can do that. But many managing brokers who are in doing trading services in regards to a rental listing may just decide that that's not something they're going to do and they'll just pass the security deposit onto the owner. Uh, if you do have a trust account for security deposits, uh, then bearing in mind that section 28.3 states that that money is not stakeholder funds. So it's only held on behalf of the owner, it's not held on behalf of the tenant. So that's the only questions that we had in advance of the meeting. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions they wish to pass on to us. Okay, so I have a question here. Can a property manager put a commercial space up for lease and negotiate a commercial offer for lease. Yes, um, so uh, a rental property manager is allowed to do commercial leasing. Um, the license, your license allows you to, to do rental property management. Uh, it doesn't define residential rental property management only. Um, ha however, the, the only caveat I would mention with that is commercial leasing is is uh, or can be quite different to residential leasing. Um, obviously, the Residential Tenancy Act doesn't apply. Um, so many contracts are between landlords and tenants in commercial uh, are drafted by a lawyer or or somebody else who's who's familiar and experienced. OK. 
Okay. Okay, so I have a question. Can the administrator in the office do a move-in and move-out inspection? Um, if the administrator is... Um, well, now that's that's a that will be a, a licensed activity um, the, because the, the move-in inspection is a contract, so only licensees can enter into a contract on behalf of the owner. Can an unlicensed person, such as a secretary, collect rent? Um, it's a licensed activity, but um, when somebody is collecting rent. Uh, it's the brokerage that's collecting the rent. So, for example, if you have a receptionist uh, and the tenant comes into the office mm -hmm. and hands the rent over, uh, then the receptionist can collect the rent on behalf of the brokerage. Okay, so when entering into a tenancy agreement with a tenant on behalf of the owner, who is named as the landlord on the, t on the agreement, the brokerage or the owner? Well, under the Residential Tenancy Act, which is not our legislation, a landlord is de de defined as the owner of the, of the real estate or their agent. However, um, we would recommend that licensees entering into a contract, a tenancy agreement, on behalf of an owner, they sign it in their own, or they, they do it in their own name or in the name of the brokerage, and they put after it agent for owner. That, that way it makes it very clear if there's ever a residential tenancy dispute that the, the owner is the, is the landlord, the one responsible. Can a caretaker or resident manager show suites and take applications? <clears throat> so there are exemptions from being licensed for caretakers and resident managers in the real estate services regulation. Um, I'm going from memory now, but it's, I think it's 2.13 of the Real Estate Services Regulation that allows an employee of the brokerage um, or to, to show suites and take applications without the requirement to be licensed. Uh, if it's an employee of the owner, then, they, then they're covered under being, uh, acting on behalf of their principal anyway. Can a residential realtor do rental as well? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we don't define the term realtor. Um, a trading services licensee can do rental listings. They can't do rental management. That's been the, the, the point of this, this seminar. Um, question about standard form management agreements available. Um, and where can you find them? Uh, the Real Estate Council doesn't provide contracts. Um, we identify in 5-1 of the rules what must be in a contract, but we don't determine a contract. If there are trading services license, I'm not sure if the question was from a trading services licensee uh, or a rental property management company, <clears throat> but uh, the boards provide the listing agreements. Um, so if they do have a, another if they've chosen to provide another contract, um, then it will be the board that you would go to. Or alternatively, see, you would need to, the brokerage would need to seek legal advice to draft up your own brokerage contract. Um, I have a question. When a property sells and the new owner wants the security deposit transferred to them, what is the legal procedure and how does the brokerage deal with this? Uh, well, it's beyond me to provide legal advice, but... Um, I believe within the professional standards manual, there are there is a clause in there that does cover that. So take a look in the clauses section of the professional standards manual. Okay. As a property management licensee, if I'm entering into a contract with an owner to provide property management services and the owner has several properties, do I need an agreement per property or can I use one agreement that lists all of the properties? Uh, you can absolutely list all of the properties on the same management agreement. 5-1 um, of the rules only requires that the address of the real estate is identified on the contract. So if you have more than one um, property that you're managing, you can put them all onto the same agreement. The only time you may want to consider is if you, if you do want to have separate agreements for different properties, is if you know that the owner is going to be buying more property or selling more property. Um, 
where actually having a separate agreement for each property may may actually be easier to manage for you rather than having to go back and making amendments to a previous contract. Who will represent tenants? So tenants always ask when I disclose that I do not represent them. Um, that's always been the case in regards to rental property management. Uh, a rental property management licensee, as we've gone through before, can't represent a tenant. Uh, and typically in residential um, rental, uh, rental property management, uh, a tenant is unlikely to be represented, but it doesn't stop them from getting representation if they choose. Um, they would just need to find an agent who is able to provide that service to them, which would mean a trading services licensee, because we've gone through and explained that a trading services licensee can represent a tenant um, in, during a trade in real estate. Okay, can I speak to personal rentals and the need for disclosure of interest in trade? Uh, so 9-1 of the rules uh, allows a licensee who if complying with all sections of that rule, uh, they are not bound by the, the act or the rules. 9-1 uh, says if the, it's, the, it's the licensee's own property and they have to make a disclosure to the tenant um, that although they're licensed, they're not acting as a licensee and the property nor the licensee is bound by the Real Estate Services Act in regards to that transaction. The licensee has to make a written disclosure to their managing broker of the, of the property that they're managing and explain exactly what they're doing. They're not, they're managing the, the property outside of the brokerage. Now, because 91 says, if you comply with all sections of the, of this, this rule, then the act and the rules do not apply. It's very important for licensees to, to ensure that they cover every single step of that rule. Uh, for example, if a licensee is advertising that rental property, they do it in their own name, not in the name of their brokerage, do not advertise um, the address of the brokerage or the telephone number of the brokerage, uh, don't have the licensee, uh, sorry, don't have the tenant drop off the rent check to your brokerage office. Uh, you keep the two things completely separate. There's you as the individual and there's you as the brokerage. And if you don't comply with all those sections, then 9-1 then doesn't apply and you're not covered by that uh, exemption. And that would, that would be where the problem would start. So always make sure that you're, you're going through every section of 9-1 of the rules and comply with every section of that. Now, in regards to property owned by um, your family partner or spouse or son or daughter or parents, um, or a corporation where the only shareholders are any of those people, you can manage those properties separately from the brokerage under 9.2 of the rules. The same disclosures are required as 9.1 with the additional disclosure that you must also disclose in writing to your son, daughter, or parent, uh, the, the same disclosure that you've provided to the tenant that you're, although you're a licensee, RESA doesn't apply um, so you're not regulated under the Real Estate Services Act for those transactions. Uh, you have to comply with all those sections, provide the, the disclosures to the managing broker. <clears throat> uh, now, if, if, you if you own an unregistered interest, or if you own an unregistered interest, um, well, if you're not on title, I mean, it's the, it's the being on title that determines whether or not you're an owner or not. Um, I know sometimes people have said, you know, well, I, I pay the mortgage. That makes me the owner. No, if you're not on title, then it's not, it's not determined that you're the owner because we have to look to the definition of an owner in the Real Estate Services Act. Okay, if the caretaker or resident manager shows suites and takes applications, do they need to use 510 or 510.1 or is this only used when the lease is signed? Okay, so because the caretaker, and we will assume it's the unlicensed caretaker who's covered under the exemption, uh, because they're not licensed, they're not required to make the 510 or 510.1 disclosures or use those forms. Uh, a licensee is only required to make those disclosures when actually dealing directly with the, with the tenant or the landlord, of course. 
Uh, so if the caretaker or resident manager performs all of the duties on behalf of, on behalf of the, the landlord um, and the licensee never is in contact with the tenants, then of course no disclosure, neither of those disclosure forms is required to be used. Um, the only times it, it might be a problem is if, for example, the resident manager can't be made, uh, isn't available and it's a Saturday afternoon and now the tenant contacts the rental manager, um, that's the point, that's the trigger because now you, you have to provide the forms and go through the disclosures. So it, it, every single situation is going to be different. It's just up to you as a licensee to manage that. And if you feel that there may be a chance that you're going to be being contacted by the tenant on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday morning, whenever, or any time the resident manager cannot be contacted, uh, then you may want to consider or not that you want, to, you want to make those disclosures in advance so you can actually deal directly with the tenants. Um, or you need to stop them and say, yeah, I know you've got water pouring through, through your ceiling, but you know, let's, let's go through these forms first. Um, okay. So there's a question here about when I show a property to prospective tenants, so I have to give them seven pieces of paper, dorts and unrepresented parties that is excessive, especially when they just want to look. Okay. So the forms are being updated. Um, the, there will be new forms being rolled out sometime shortly. Uh, I can't promise when, um, but it won't be seven pieces of paper in the future. Okay. Uh, another question on the same topic, um, asking if the door uh, disclosure representation and trading services form will be amended or eliminated for rental property management. Uh, I don't believe so, uh, but they will be amended to make them significantly shorter and easier to understand and to manage. <clears throat> Can a licensee have both licenses, a trading services licensee and a rental, uh, a rental property management licensee? Yes, you can. Can an unlicensed assistant show a rental property? Okay, that depends actually. Um, if the unlicensed assistant is an employee of the brokerage, in that employee employer like relationship, then they will be covered under the exemption in two, 2.13 of the, of the real estate services regulation, and they will be able to show the property. If the unlicensed assistant is not in an employee employer like relationship with the brokerage, but is perhaps um, being paid by the licensee or on a contract basis with the brokerage, then they would not be able to show the property. Okay. Um, question here, just uh, going on from the, the exemptions. Uh, we manage a residential rental building uh, for a recent client. The building manager who does move-ins and move-outs and rent collection is not licensed. The building manager was hired by the owner of the property. We'll provide payroll services for, for the manager. Is this in accordance with the regulation? Uh, it depends whether or not the building manager is an employee of the brokerage or you're just providing payroll services and it's the, they're an employee of the owner. If they're an employee of the owner, um, then they're covered under a different section of the regulation. I believe it's 2.1 of the real estate services regulation where um, an unlicensed person can act as if they're the principal in that relationship and do everything that the, the owner of the property could do themselves. Okay. As a, as a trading services licensee, we charge the first month's rent for our fee. Can we collect that fee directly from the tenant in their first month's rent check, or do we need to collect that from the owner? Well, you can't collect that fee from the, the tenant um, for two reasons. One, they're not your client, so they can't pay you. But secondly, you can't collect that first month's rent because now you're collecting rent. Whether or not it's deemed to be your fee or not, as soon as you collect rent, you're in contravention of, of uh, the Real Estate Services Act. So what you would need to do is the, the rent check would need to be paid by the tenant directly to the owner, and then you would invoice the, um, your client for your fee. Okay, to confirm an unlicensed agent, uh, an unlicensed person can perform showings Routine inspections, however, cannot sign uh, the, the tenancy agreement, walk through inspections, negotiations. Um, yet, yeah, take a look at 2.13 of the um, real estate services regulation, and you can see what a 
an unlicensed person employed by the brokerage can do. Uh, I've just been told they've got less than two minutes left. So I'm going to try and pick some short ones here. Uh, what if a rental property management licensee suspects a renovation was completed by the landlord without proper approval of the municipality, but there's no evidence except the work is poorly done? Does the licensee still have an obligation to disclose to the tenant the suspected material latent defect? Well, in that question, you would br you would bring to the attention of your client your requirement your requirement to disclose to the tenant any known material latent defects. Have the discussion with them. If they tell you, for example, not to disclose that, then you need to walk away from the contract. And I know I'm rapidly running out of time. When disclosing a material latent defect in a residential tenancy, what is the procedure? Um, take a look at um, 5-13 of the rules. That'll, that'll explain it in more detail. Uh, alternatively, go to the professional standards manual and type in material latent defect, and it'll pull up some information there for you. If the property has joint name under my name and my sibling's name, is it, can be, is it also considered as my own property? Uh, yes, yes. Um, but it's a good question because, it, of course, your siblings, if it was just your sibling's property, that would not be covered under 9.2 of the rules. And I've probably got 10 seconds left. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I do apologize. I'm completely out of time. Um, any questions we haven't answered today, um, I will try and get back to you or maybe we'll put them in a, in a questions section on the, uh, on the presentation once it's put up onto the website. So thank you very much for your time today. And I believe that is it. Um, if, you, if, I, if I've got a few more seconds. Uh, if you do have any questions, you are able to contact um, any of the professional standards advisors, of which I am one, of my two colleagues, Bruce McCubrey and Marty Douglas. We are here Monday to Friday to answer your questions about professional practice matters. And you can email us at advisor, A-D-V-I-S-O-R, at recbc.ca. Thank you very much.